Ternalo Falls in Oregon has always been my favorite place to hike. I've been hiking most of my life. It started when I was real young. Back in those days, my dad would carry me in a pack on his back for miles and miles up the sides of hills and down into canyons. Every family vacation we ever took was a hiking trip. When I first moved to Oregon, I naturally started looking for the best hiking spots to spend my weekends. Ternalo Falls was easily the best. I loved hiking to the top of the waterfall, and I loved having the view of the waterfall as I hiked towards it. I also loved that there were plenty of off-the-beaten-path places to explore, but always a trail nearby and the sound of the waterfall to guide you, especially if you wound up getting yourself turned around. Also, there weren't many people there. I was stunned by how rarely I ran into other hikers. One day, I did run across a hiker, though, who seemed somehow strange. To me, he looked paranoid and was sweating and struggling to maintain his composure. He came straight up to me and very seriously asked me where we were, and I told him we were at Ternalo Falls. He asked what year it was, and I told him it was 2007, which it was. There was an unmistakable look of relief that spread across his face as he realized he was wherever he was supposed to be. He then told me to turn around, don't go any further into those woods. I asked why not, and he told me just to listen to him as he ran off toward the parking area. I'm not someone that's easily scared off, and I was familiar with the area, so, in fact, it only inspired me to walk further in. Whatever had shaken him up in there, I wanted to find it. I seemed to walk forever and nothing really stood out to me as being terrifying or worrisome. I couldn't figure out what had caused the guy to behave in such a way, so I just chalked it up to something I'd never figure out. When I turned around to head back though, I did start to notice something very strange. The walking paths that were so evident only moments before now weren't visible. I wondered if I had really walked that far off the path, and I just couldn't see them anymore. Well, the idea of that made me panic a little bit. I remembered my dad telling me that if you're ever lost in the woods, you should set up some kind of marker so you can tell if you're walking in circles. Fortunately, I had a red handkerchief in my pocket, so I tied it around a slim tree branch, then started exploring the area. It didn't take long for me to start noticing more weird stuff. I came across an area in the mud where it looked like a number of horses had come through. I tried counting and figured at least 10 or 11 horses had come through, all heading in the same direction. There was no indication that they'd wandered from their path, so I assumed there were riders, maybe trail riders from the local stable club. I decided to follow the hooves for a while and see if I might come up to the group. Maybe they'd have some idea of what had happened to my wide-eyed new friend I'd just met further down the trail. When I came over the hill, though, I couldn't believe my eyes. It wasn't a bunch of riders from the stable club. It was a bunch of what looked like cowboys on horseback, and at the bottom of the hill were several covered wagons the type you'd see in an old western movie. I figured they must be some kind of reenactment, maybe of the Oregon Trail, so I decided to approach and ask. I was impressed with the authenticity of their costumes and the wagons and wanted to see them up close. When they saw me approaching, though, they looked like they'd seen a ghost. Now, this is where I should probably tell you that I'm a dark-skinned person. My mother is Indian and my father is Pakistani. While I'm not a Native American, I probably looked close enough the part to these folks. So, all at once, I find myself with several guns pointed right at me. They start yelling, asking me what tribe I belong to and scanning the horizon as if they thought there might be more of me coming. I still wasn't sure what was going on, but thought their reception of a dark-skinned person was a little bit racist even if they were trying to stay in character, and I proceeded to tell them as much. This was when they just looked at me, 
even more confused and asked me what the hell I wanted. I told them I'd come to compliment them but had changed my mind. They said something about my friend having already been by there and not to send anyone else. Then I heard a woman comment on how funny we were dressed. Then I turned to walk back the other way and that's when one of them shot the ground by my feet to hurry me along. Only then did I realize the guns they were aiming at me were real and I set off running as fast as I could until I found that handkerchief. I grabbed it from the tree and headed back the direction I'd come from when I first tied it. All at once, after I'd run a little bit, I realized I could see the trails again. I turned and looked, and the trails all stretched back as far as the eye could see. I have no explanation for why they weren't visible to me before that. Well, mostly no explanation. I read online a few weeks after that about portals to the past that have opened up in secluded areas a few times throughout history. I'm convinced that's exactly what happened to me that day. Believe it or not, I know what I saw. This happened a while back, a few years now, and it's one of those things that just changes your life, you know? It was during a road trip. Me and a friend of mine were heading to Charleston, West Virginia. My aunt was sick and the whole family was gathering together at her house. She lives just outside the city, really. My friend came along so that we could just drive on through, change drivers when one gets tired, you know? We were driving down through Ohio. It seemed to be the easiest route on the map I had. I had only been to see my aunt a few times and I didn't know the way by heart. We drove for a few hours, then stopped in Jackson, Ohio to get gas and food. Nothing really special, just fast food and a chance to stretch our legs. We'd been in the car maybe three hours, maybe three and a half. I wasn't really sure at that point. Things began to get weird, I think, after Jackson. So we get back in the car and head out for the 35. It seemed to be the best route, took us nearly to Charleston. We were driving for maybe an hour on the 35 and my gas gauge goes haywire. The needle is going up and down over and over again and then it just crashes on E. I pull over and restart the car, give it some gas, hoping maybe I can fix it or something. It's dead. That's not great on a road trip. Well, really it's not great any time and it's a pain to have it fixed as well. So I know I just filled the tank, but it's something we have to keep in mind now. We keep going on the 35, I don't remember how long, maybe 20 minutes or so, but we end up stopping again at a McDonald's to use their bathroom and get something to drink. It's Jerry's fault, really, my buddy that I brought with me. He has the bladder the size of a peanut sometimes. It was weird, though. I was walking around the parking lot and it felt like someone was watching me. I looked around at the other people in the lot and around the restaurant, the drive through No one was particularly paying attention to anything. I had that feeling when the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Jerry took over driving from there. I had already been doing it for a while and wanted a break. We left and got back onto 35 and that's when I first saw it. It looked like a big bird. I caught it out of the corner of my eye. Thought maybe it was a hawk or an eagle. I know Ohio has hawks. I was a lot less certain if eagles flew around. I guess it could have been a vulture too. Anyway, I caught sight of it and tried to follow it with my eyes. It wasn't dark yet and there was still a lot of light but it was so far away I wasn't sure what it was. It circled the car for a bit and then seemed to fly off. We just kept talking about everyday stuff once I lost track of it. After about five or ten minutes I saw it again and it was closer this time. It was big, so it wasn't a hawk. It was dark in color too, so I decided it was definitely an eagle or a vulture. I thought it was odd though that it seemed to follow us, but maybe it was just circling around the freeway looking for roadkill. Jerry thought it was odd that I kept looking for it and we had a good laugh at that. 
I don't know, there was just something about it that made me continue to look for it, you know? Another maybe five minutes go by, and this time it's really close, and looks like it's moving faster. Again, it's pretty big. Now people tell me it's hard to judge how big something is in the air or under the water. That might be true, but this seemed so clear. It was either man-sized or close enough that it didn't really matter. It was big, and this time it really looked like it was following the car. Jerry doesn't believe me, so he tells me he's going to get off the 35 and see what happens. It's just a bird. He gets off on some road, and it says there's a little town up ahead. Rodney, I think. I don't really remember. But something really small at the end of the road we're on. I look around in the sky and don't see anything. Jerry's laughing at me, telling me I told you so. Just a bird flying around. Something then hits the back of the car, and I turn around, and it's there. Big, dark wings, dark color. I couldn't see its face except for these big, red eyes. I'm yelling at Jerry, and he's yelling, looking in the rearview mirror. He guns it down the street. We're flying at this point. There's no way this thing's going to catch up to us and it's shrinking behind us. Just a few minutes later, we see a gas station and drive right into its parking lot. First thing I do is jump out of the car and look around in the sky around us. I see it. It's climbing higher and higher, but I see it. I tried to get it on my phone, but it looks just like a dark blur in the sky. I'm pointing at it, and Jerry's pointing and looking at it, and we look insane to the people around us. This older guy walks up to us and asks why we're freaking out over a bird. I just look at Jerry, and he looks at me. I mean, what do you say? What can you say? I just rubbed the back of my neck and tell him the bird hit our car and it freaked us out. I didn't know what else to say. We looked over the car. It seemed fine. There weren't any dents or scratches or anything. We just sat in that marathon parking lot for like an hour. We just kept watching the sky and the car. I never told my family, never told my aunt. Me and Jerry talk about it once in a while, but not often. It's not like anyone would believe us anyway. I'm a trapper currently located in upstate Colorado just outside of the Medicine Bow Route National Forest. I wanted to tell my story about encountering a skinwalker last winter while trapping. Most of what I trap in this area are mink, pine marten, badgers, and hare. I also get the occasional fox, although that isn't my main staple as a trapper. My great-great-grandfather was native, so some myths and legends always got passed down. Mostly, they were told to make kids behave. My mom had quite a few she'd tell us if we were acting up. In December of last year, I was out at the trapping grounds my family had inherited, setting up and checking traps. We have a very small one-room cabin out there, but I'm the only one who still traps. The terrain out there can be very remote. It's a mountainous region with a mix of trees and steep rock faces. In the winter months, it can be very dangerous to be out there if you're not familiar with the weather patterns or prepared for the cold. I've been trapping since I was a kid, so I always have the essentials. A first aid kit with a trauma kit included, sub-zero clothing, flint, matches, and backup parts for my snowmobile. Around the cabin, I do my rounds on foot since it's all within a two mile radius. But throughout the season, I'll trap further out. During the two weeks in December I was in the area, I was trapping close to the cabin. At night I went out to set traps and starting just after sunrise, I'd go out and check them. This way I can get a good look at any tracks that appeared overnight or find any bait that needs to be replaced. After a few days of getting into my normal routine, I took a day off to stock up on firewood and clean some extra traps I'd brought with me. In Colorado, you have to use live traps and kill the animals you catch on site, so I always carry a small pistol and a shotgun with me as well. 
Traps have to be cleaned and descented using a boiling technique. Any human touch or contact with human items like clothing or the backseat of a vehicle can alert the animals and they won't go anywhere near it. It takes a few hours for this process, so I figured between that and the firewood, I just let the traps already out sit for another day. I made a pot of oatmeal, got a fire started, and then went back to wait for the water to boil. I use a pot that most people use for canning jars because it's deep and wide, plus holds up well under high temperatures. I'd just thrown the traps in and set the lid on top using a branch when I noticed a track near the camp. At first, I thought it was a track I'd left the day before when scoping out good trees to fell in the area. But I quickly realized that something was wrong. The track was of a bare foot. Temperatures in upstate Colorado in December can reach the negatives, so I knew right away that either the person who had made this track was probably dead or not a person at all. Even though I've been trapping for over 30 years now and seen a lot of gruesome things, the hair on the back of my neck still stood up. It never feels good knowing that someone or something has been around your camp and you haven't noticed. It makes you wonder if they've been looking in the windows at night watching you. Luckily, the cabin only has one window and I keep it blocked during the winter to retain heat. Despite the feeling I had that something was wrong about this, I knew I had to do my duty and check around to make sure there wasn't a missing or injured person who had made their way into my camp. That was highly unlikely since the cabin was obvious and they would have knocked under most circumstances. I followed the tracks and sure enough, they led into the camp and right back out into the scrub trees surrounding. I checked the rest of the camp and didn't see any other footsteps. After about 45 minutes, I felt calm enough to focus on my tasks again and set about pulling the traps out of the bath and letting them dry. That was my mistake. I let my guard down. At some point, I heard breathing and turned around. A man was standing at the edge of camp wearing furs from head to toe. He looked haggard, with a pitted face and dark eyes that I couldn't see under the brim of his hat. And his feet were bare. I reached for my shotgun, which I always have nearby, and called out to ask what he wanted. The feeling of foreboding I got was strong. There were a few tense moments before the man moved off, incredibly quickly, too quickly for a human man to achieve. He moved back into the woods and I lost sight of him for a few moments. In the next instant, I saw some kind of animal. It looked like an oversized coyote, scrawny and mangy, loping through the trees and away from me. Right then, I was sure that what I'd seen was a skinwalker. I have no idea why he didn't do anything other than look at me and come around the camp. According to legends, encounters with skinwalkers almost always end in injury or death. It's supposed to be kill or be killed with these things, so I'm not sure why he ran instead of confronting me, but I'm glad he did. Although he looked like a man at first, I'm not stupid enough to think I could put up a fight against one of those creatures. I've been back to the cabin a few times since, and I haven't seen any sign of him. No human tracks, and no coyote tracks either. At least, none that stand out as strangely large. But it's good to know they're in the area, because now I usually take one of my cousins or friends trapping with me, and I always carry an extra weapon on me as well. Can't be too careful, even if creatures like these are dying out these days. <laughs>